Well, let's get uh, started here for those that may be out there uh, at the vendors socializing. Uh, um, I, think, I think you're allowed to have coffee in here. I don't know. That's a good question for Jim Nichols. Well, our first speaker this morning is Dr. John Walton, who is a professor of uh, Old Testament at Wheaton College. He's been there for how many years? 14 years. And before that, he was at uh, Moody for 20 years, right? Uh, he's the author or uh, co-author of over 20 books, including um, an excellent Old Testament survey book and uh, various uh, commentaries. And um, more recently, you've been doing work on the book of Job, right? Um, among various other things. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here this morning. And uh, some of his work has been, um, dare we say, a little bit controversial in the scholarship. But I've really, yeah, yeah just a little bit. Um, but I've certainly benefited from much of what he has had to say. And um, now, I don't know if you remember my talk from last night on the spiritual virtues, but two of those were intellectual humility and open-mindedness. So I hope maybe we'll exercise some of those virtues here in, in what uh, Dr. Walton has to present to us this morning. Um, so great. Without further ado, Dr. John Walton. How did you come up here? Thank you. Thank you for coming and braving the rain and all of that. So, um, so yes, we're going to talk about some things that are a little controversial today. Uh, notice a target painted on my back? No, okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we want to talk about. But of course, if we never talk about controversial things, how can we ever think through them? And uh, so that's really what I want to try to get at today. This is part of my origins today uh, series, um, and uh, I've got the book Lost World of Genesis 1, which I talked about some last time we had an apologetics conference, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about Genesis 2 and 3, which is even more controversial, uh, just because they raise issues, raise issues that we have to deal with. We're very much inclined to think in terms of a conflict model, that somehow science and the Bible science and Christianity are, are at, at loggerheads, and that there's a conflict, and we have to figure out who's right, and we have to accept one and discard the other. And certainly that could be true if, uh, if science were telling us there is no God, you know, well, yeah, we've got some issues with that. Okay, but uh, they, there may not be as much conflict as we might think. Um, and in order to try to approach this, uh, I don't try to explain the science or defend the science. I've really got no science to defend. I'm not a scientist. I, I really don't, don't have anything on the table there, no vested interests. Okay, I'm a Bible guy. I'm a text guy. And so I want to try to make sure we understand what the text claims. After all, what usually happens is we have this idea that the Bible has certain claims and that those are in conflict with claims that science is making. And so then, of course, we stand with the Bible, and that forces us into a conflict situation. And that may be the case. If that's so, you know, well, we, we go to the hill and we die on it, you know, but, but if the claims are, are not understood clearly, we may end up having conflict where there doesn't need to be any. So what I want to do is make sure that we understand the claims clearly enough from the Bible standpoint. Now, biblical authority is my foundation. I'm not going to go through the hermeneutics of that here, but you know, for me, we have to get our understanding of what the Bible's claims are because we consider it the authority foundation for our beliefs. And therefore, I want to know what the biblical author is saying because I'm going to stand by that. Now, that biblical author part is the important part because the biblical author is an ancient Israelite. I mean, it's God ultimately, but it's an ancient Israelite and God chose to work through those ancient Israelite authors. And he communicated to them and they communicated and God's message then is all bound up in the human author's message. If I'm going to get to what God has to say, I have to go through that human author. And when I do that, I have to engage 
the ancient language. Maybe I engage it because someone translates it for me. That's how most of you do it. That's not how I do it, of course, because I like to go right to the Hebrew text. Okay, or, but I also have to engage it through the author's culture. If God had more to say than what he told that author, then I have no way of getting at it. Because I can only approach God's message through the author that he chose to, to communicate it to. Now, if God gave further messages somewhere on in the New Testament, well, great, that's, that's fine. But my approach to any passage is to begin with trying to say, what is it that this author and his audience understood? Because that's how God chose to, to work. Okay, so we have to get into the ancient world. We have to get into the Hebrew text. We have to get into the ancient world. Because that's, that's how the whole process of communication works. Now, that's the way we get to the authority of the text. Because if we have an understanding that's different from what the author meant, well, we've, we've cut the authority link. Okay? So that's the, the basic hermeneutical principle that we're following. So we start by looking at some of the textual issues here. <clears throat> In Genesis 2 and 3, uh, the biggest issue that we're going to talk about today is human origins. So we start with the word Adam. Adam, of course, is a Hebrew word. Hey, you know Hebrew. Okay. Adam is a Hebrew word, and it refers to humanity. It's used that way all through Hebrew scriptures. And so Adam is human. Now, we're used to reading the early chapters of Genesis and reading Adam as a personal name, Adam. Okay, and... Uh, so let's examine the use of this word in these early chapters of Genesis. 34 times it occurs in Genesis 1 through 5. Now, in a number of those places, it occurs without a definite article. Definite article in English, of course, is the. Uh, Hebrew, it's a different word, but okay. Um, it occurs without the definite article. Now, without the definite article, it could be a personal name, Adam. Okay, and there are five times where it looks like it's a personal name, an individual who has this name. Now, of course, even as I, as I say that, Adam didn't call Eve Eve, and Eve didn't call Adam Adam. I know that because those are Hebrew words, and Hebrew as a language did not come into existence until the second millennium, long after Adam and Eve. So they did not call each other Adam and Eve. I don't know what they called each other. Probably honey and sweetie. No, I don't know. Okay? They didn't, but they, they didn't call each other Adam and Eve. Okay, so already we have a Hebrew text that is communicating something by these names. I believe Adam and Eve are historical people, real people in a real past. But these are not their historical names. Can't be. They're Hebrew. That already. Okay, you're already flying. Oh, whoa. Okay. So, five times as a personal name. Five times as humanity, generically speaking, referring both to male and female, referring to a corporate group, Adam, without the definite article. But then it occurs most of the times in Genesis 2 and 3, it occurs with the definite article. So we find it 20 times, and here we would have to say this has to be archetypal, okay, because it's the human. It's not a personal name. Hebrew doesn't put definite articles on personal names. We don't in English either, oh, except for the Donald. Oh, yeah, okay, never mind. Okay, so we usually don't put <laughs> definite articles on personal names, okay, and Hebrew doesn't either. So when it has a definite article, it's not using it as a personal name. If it's not using it as a personal name, it's not really focusing on him as an individual person, even though he is one but it's rather focusing on his more archetypal, representative nature. 20 times in Genesis 2 and 3. Three times with a preposition, that gets technical, we're not going to get into it. So, we've got even some complexity as we look at the use of the term Adam in the initial chapters. Now, another larger issue that we have to address before we actually get into Genesis 2 concerns the question of how is Genesis 2 related to the seven days in Genesis 1? 
most casual readers assume that Genesis 2 gives us a more extensive look at day 6. Now, that would be a recapitulation. That is, it's given you the seven days, okay? But now, Genesis 2 is going to recapitulate day 6, giving more detail. That's how we usually read it. It's understandable that we would read it that way. Because we read in day 6 that God made people, and we read in chapter 2 about God making Adam and Eve, and we automatically draw those two together. At the same time, we don't usually recognize, because we're so ingrained in our traditional ways of reading, we don't usually recognize that Genesis 1 doesn't say anything about Adam and Eve on day 6. It doesn't even say that there were just two. God created people, male and female. He created them. It doesn't mention just two. And so it's a worthwhile question to ask. Questions are always worthwhile to ask. It's a worthwhile question to ask. Are we sure that Genesis 2 is a recapitulation of day 6? Now we might say, well, I, I don't know what alternatives there would be. That's not a reason to abandon that question. It's a reason to think further of what other alternatives there might be. Well, how would we know what the relationship is? Now, that's a good question. Genesis 2.4 comes between the two accounts. Genesis 2.4 is this is the account, the Toledot, of the heavens and the earth. Now, that's a hint. Because we have a literary transition between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And it's not unique. In fact, some 11 times throughout the book of Genesis, this transition occurs. In other words, it's a normal structural element in the book of Genesis. Now, that's great, because now we can look at all 11 of them and say, what is the typical relationship between what comes before and what comes after? Since it's used 11 times, what's the relationship between the things on either end? Because that's exactly what we want to know about Genesis 1 and 2. And we especially want to know, are any of them, <coughs> excuse me, are any of them recapitulation? Because that's kind of our intu intuitive reading of Genesis 1 and 2. Well, as we look through this list, we find out that no, there are none of them that are recapitulative. They tend to be either a sequel or recursive. Let me just briefly explain what I mean by recursive. Uh, for instance, the text will deal with Ishmael and him going away and his genealogy, and then it has this Toledot transition, and it comes back and picks up Isaac, an Isaac story. So that's not a sequel. Ishmael and Isaac live, you know, at the same time. But it's not recapitulation. They're not telling you more about Ishmael's story. So it re it's recursive. It comes back then to deal with the line it really wants to deal with. You can see that there are three of them that are recursive. And it's the same kind of thing in each case. <clears throat> the rest are sequels. That suggests to us what our alternatives are. Let's take a look at Genesis 2 and think about whether it could be a sequel to Genesis 1 in the seven days, rather than thinking about as recapitulative of day 6. Now, that, that really offers us some relief, because we wondered how all the things in Genesis 2 could happen in one day, in Genesis 1. And in fact, things seem to be in a little bit different order in Genesis 2 than in Genesis 1. So there were some problems with the recapitulative view. As a sequel, we wouldn't have those problems. But as a sequel, we have to ask the question, well, if Adam and Eve are a sequel and day 6 isn't really addressing them, then why the big deal about Adam and Eve? What's going on? Of course, those are excellent questions but they're questions we would have never asked unless we were kind of working through this process. So, none of them are recapitulative. Uh, if it's a sequel, then the people in Genesis 1 are not necessarily Adam and Eve. There are, there are options. 
Maybe they include Adam and Eve. Maybe they are just Adam and Eve. Maybe something else. Maybe Adam and Eve came later. Okay? All kinds of options that we have to consider, even if just to rule them out. Okay? The second account then doesn't need to fit into day six, which is a relief because that was a little bit of a problem. And so we can start asking the question, if Genesis 2 is a sequel, then what's going on with Adam and Eve? And that's what we'd like to explore. Now I would like to propose uh, my basic view of dealing with Adam and Eve is to understand them in archetypal ways. The idea would be that everything in Genesis 2 concerned with the human origins is archetypal in nature. Now we've already seen that the use of the definite article with Adam suggests that we've got an archetypal view. But maybe I need to explain archetypal. When I use the term archetypal, I'm not just talking about prototypes. Prototype is the first one in line, off the assembly line and all the rest come after it, okay, on the same pattern. That's a prototype. It's interesting, I looked this up in the dictionary once and I looked up archetype and it said see prototype. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I'm not talking about just prototypes. In, in literature, when they talk about archetypes, they're talking about an archetypal sort of character. The villain, the hero, the damsel in distress, the Frodo, yeah, okay. Archetypes of various sorts. Okay, and I'm not really talking about that either, although that has similarity. By archetype, what I'm talking about is that this archetype embodies the whole group. So when, when we learn that we all sin in Adam, Paul's treating Adam as an archetype. We're all embodied in Adam. We're all doing what Adam is doing. Adam is all of us. That's the archetype idea. Now again, remember I've made the point that Adam and Eve are individuals who really existed. But individuals who really exist can also be used as archetypes. I mean Frodo, for instance. No, never mind. Okay, so... <laughs> So they can, be, they can be used that way. Abraham is an archetype of all who believe. Okay, Jesus is an archetype. They really exist, but they can be used archetypally. And in fact, Paul almost always uses Adam and Eve archetypally when he talks about them. So the forming accounts, I would say, are most relevant to Adam and Eve as archetypes rather than as individuals. Now you would say, well, how do you know that? How can you tell whether it's one or the other? It's actually an easy test. It's identified as archetypal if it refers to everyone, not just those individuals. In other words, we have to ask the question, when Adam's forming is described, is the Bible telling us something that is uniquely true of Adam? Or is it telling us something that is true of all of us? That's the deciding factor. If it's true of all of us, then it's archetypal in nature. If it's only true of Adam or only true of Eve, then that would be an individual focus. So we're going to look at the text to find out. Okay, we want to get these ideas from the text. So, we look at the idea of being formed from dust. Now lots of us, again, when we read you know, it's really hard to read these with fresh eyes because we're so used to the stories. And we just breeze right through them. I know this story. Vroom. And we don't pause to think. But lots of times when we think about Adam being formed from dust, um, <clears throat> we immediately assume that there's a material process because it uses the word formed. And boy, that sounds like a hands-on kind of process. Okay? However, when we look at that verb throughout Scripture, the Hebrew verb, throughout the Old Testament, we find that often it is not used in material context. Do I have that slide here? Yes. Events planned long ago. That's the same verb. Events. The heart is formed, and there it's not talking about the blood pump. It's talking about the thoughts being formed. Days ordained by God. 
This is just a couple of samples. You find over and over again that this word is not being used in those kinds of ways. It's interesting that even on Egyptian monuments, reliefs, they show the creator God forming the pharaoh on a potter's wheel. But the text all around it makes it very clear that it's not talking about his human origin. It's talking about forming him to be pharaoh, forming his identity, forming his role. He's being made king. And so this idea that forming has to do with identity. The Lord who stretches out the heavens and the earth, foundation, lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the human spirit. That's identity. It's not a physical expression. So right from the get-go, we have to think, okay, wait a second. Just because it's using the word formed, maybe I have to think beyond what my normal impulse would be. Well, then we get further into the, the text and um, we think about this idea of dust. What's going on? Some of us might think in terms of chemistry. And I've seen people try to des describe what are the chemical ingredients of dust and what are the chemical ingredients of the human body and is there a way that we, we are formed from dust. And sometimes it even gets to stardust. Lots of the dust is stardust and lots of things are made from stardust, including the human body. Okay, that's reading a very advanced science in between the lines of the text, clearly not what the human author would have had in mind. The human author doesn't know anything about stardust, and the human author has a very small periodic table. No, he doesn't have any. Okay, no chemistry. Okay, so we really can't think in terms of chemistry or stardust. That doesn't honor or respect the human author's intention where authority is located. Other people think in terms of craftsmanship. You know, the molding, you know, the... Um, the idea that God's getting his hands dirty. You know, we think of Pinocchio and Geppetto, you know, the forming a craftsmanship model. Well, that would work fine if it was clay. Dust doesn't fit. You actually can't form dust. You can form clay. Dust kind of has no cohesion. It doesn't, you can't do it. So, neither chemistry nor craftsmanship suit the context. If it's not those things, then what is dust doing here? What is it communicating? Well, we turn to the text, and fortunately, it helps us. We don't even have to go one chapter, and we find out that dust equals mortality. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now that seems like an easy solution, but it's not easy at all, and it's not been a popular one. Because if you say that Adam being formed from dust means that he was mortal, we suddenly have a Paul problem. We're appalled. Okay, we have a Paul problem, sorry. Uh, it's, I know it's early, haven't had a cup of coffee yet? Okay, so we, we've got the, the difficulty because we read Paul and he says that we are subject to death because of sin, Romans 5. And we conclude from that that, oh, so Paul's saying that we were created immortal. No, that's not what Paul says. Let's read more carefully. Let's not draw assumptions, draw inferences that Paul's not saying. Let's think about it again in Genesis 3. Genesis 2, rather. We'll start there. In Genesis 2. God provides a garden, and in the garden he puts two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of? Yeah. Immortal people don't need a tree of life. That's a waste. How about a tree of Twinkies? No, never mind. Okay? Immortal people don't need a tree of life. That's no good to them. Huh. Well, but then what would Paul be saying? What Paul is saying is, He's working with the basis, he doesn't say this, but if people were created mortal, the tree of life provides an antidote, a remedy. They had access to that remedy. But when they sinned, they lost access to the remedy. 
right? The text makes a specific point in 324. They're cast out of the garden, and the cherub is set up with a flaming sword, sharp teeth. No, it doesn't say that. Um, all to, to defend the way to the tree of life. So, because of death, no, I'm sorry, because of sin, they're subject to death because they have no remedy. Suddenly, we're even reading Paul differently. <clears throat> but we move further. There are other passages that talk about being formed from dust. This is an important one Psalm 103. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. Now that's the same Hebrew terminology, formed, dust. We know that the psalmist is reflecting on, on Genesis 2. Same terminology. You can't miss it. But there's something very, very important here that we do tend to miss. Look at that. We. We are formed from dust. We're all formed from dust. Every human is formed from dust. But think about that. Paul says the same thing. Job says the same thing. Ecclesiastes says the same thing. We're all from dust. Being formed from dust, therefore, follow the logic, being formed from dust, therefore, does not describe material formation. You are formed from dust, but you were born of woman. That means being formed from dust does not preclude being born of woman. And when it says Adam was formed from dust, it's making a statement that is true of every one of us, not just uniquely true of Adam. And it's not something that is a statement about biological, material, human origins. It's not that for you. There's no reason to think it's that for Adam. It is not material origin. It is identity. That's what archetype deals with. Identity. This is who we are. We are mortal. We are frail. It's what all of us are. So it's intended to communicate what all humans are, not what Adam uniquely is. Yeah, we'll have time for questions. Okay. Let's move on to woman. Does Adam believe that Eve has been built from his rib? Now you're all saying, if he's asking that question and the answer sounds very obvious, it probably isn't. And I'm just going to listen. Okay? Does Adam believe that? No, he doesn't. How do we know? We know that because he tells us. First line out of his mouth. Bone of my bone. He could have stopped there. If it was just rib. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We're not talking about a single rib here. A side of ribs? A rack of ribs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Give me that full slab. Yeah. Okay, so what's going on here? Again, we ask. Well, we should... It, it says rib in my Bible. It, there it is. It says rib. Well, that's a translation. We have to look at the Hebrew word. So let's look at all the other places in the Hebrew Bible, where this word is used to describe anatomy. Okay, we're done. There are none. This is the only one. It's not the only occurrence of the word, however. It occurs some 20 other times. As an architectural term pertaining to one side of a pair. This side of the temple, that side of the temple. This side of the altar, that side of the altar. The, al the north side, the south side. One side of a pair. Ad 
God took one of Adam's sides, and he's only got two. He took half of Adam and built, preferably the better half, I, I understand, took half of Adam and built the woman. They're halves of a whole. They're, excuse my language, ontologically equal. They're the same in essence, in nature. Remember, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't talking about, he's so lonely. And he wasn't talking about needing a reproduction partner, else he wouldn't have been looking among the animals, just saying. What he's looking for is someone who is his equal to be his ally in the task that he has been given. And that's what Eve is, his ontological match. Aramaic, Septuagint Greek, Vulgate are all ambiguous on this word. They use a word that can also mean side. It could mean a rib or a bunch of ribs. It can also mean side. Third and fourth century AD, Rabbi Samuel Nachmani is already arguing that this should be side, not rib, just by the logic of the passage. Now, what's going on then with the deep sleep? What's, what's happening in the passage? I mean, after all, if God's taking half of Adam, that's fairly significant surgery. Good thing he has a powerful anesthetic. Wait a second. Israelites wouldn't think of anesthetics. They don't know anything about putting someone under for surgery. We can't think of the text in modern terms. We have to read the author. And so when we think of this procedure, we ought to examine this deep sleep. You know, that's not count to ten backwards, you know. So, we do the usual thing. We look at how it's used throughout Scripture. Typical procedure. Okay, so how is this word used? It's used in a couple different ways. Sometimes it's used to refer to a situation where someone is asleep, being oblivious to danger that's lurking, that's imminent. Jonah, sleeping in the boat, even though the boat's thinking about breaking up. Breaking up's hard to do. So, Jonah, this danger is there. Okay, um, Saul is sleeping when David creeps into the camp, has the spear poised over him. Sisera, the general of the Canaanite army, Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges. He's fleeing the battle scene. He goes to the tent of Jael and Hever thinking that he's got an ally there, and she gives him nice warm milk and covers him up with a nice blanket, and he dozes off. And next thing you know, she's holding a tent peg and a hammer. It's another temple story. Anyway, um, and, sorry, inside joke. Um, and, and there again, impending danger, and he's unaware of it. Okay, so sometimes this word is used in those kinds of contexts. We don't we don't want to use that here in Genesis 2. We don't want to think of the creation of women as impending danger. Okay, so that doesn't work here. We've got another very good alternative, however. And that is that sometimes the, the word is used to refer to someone who is in a visionary state. So the visionary state, they're unresponsive to the human realm, correspondingly responsive to communication from the divine realm. This is true, for instance, of Abraham in Genesis 15, the ratification of the covenant. Cuts up the animals, deep sleep, and God ratifies the covenant by the torch and censer passing between the animals. Okay, Really important moment, a spiritual watershed that is shown in a vision. So the idea that we're not talking about surgery, but we're talking about a vision where Adam sees himself cut in two, building Eve. And having seen that in a vision, when Eve is brought, he says, now I know what this is. This is, this is Isha. I am Ish, and this is Isha. Isha is just the feminine form. That's man and woman. 
She's the same as me. And so again, this story has to do with identity. Adam from dust has to do with identity. Edom from the side of Adam has to do with identity. Likewise, the ancient languages, as they translated this, Septuagint used ecstasis. You recognize ecstasy in that. Okay, the visionary kind of state. So, the archetypal element is nailed down in 224. This is why a man would leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. Okay, because this ontological match, connection, is closer than the biological relationship to his parents. And they become one flesh. That's not a reference to sex. That's not a euphemism for a sexual encounter. That's saying they restore again that ontological whole. They become one flesh again. Because that's what man and woman are. Now, that's not saying if you don't get married that you're just only half a person. This is talking about the race. It's not talking about individuals. You don't go around trying to find your other half. You match. Okay. We don't do that, okay? It, this is, this is species-wide. But again, archetypal. This pertains to everybody, not just Eve. All womankind is from the side of all mankind. It's who we are as man and woman. Archetypal. It's true of all, not just of one. Now, what's this task? So why do they do this in chapter 2? And you've got back there in chapter 1, why are Adam and Eve different? Well, I'm suggesting here that the Adam and Eve story, the forming accounts, are not talking about God creating them biologically as a species. This is about learning their identity. And it has nothing to do with whether Adam and Eve are the first of the biological species. They're the ones who are given this information about human identity. Why give it to them? Because they have been chosen. They have been chosen for a particular task, and it's a priestly task. How do I know that? The text tells us. Genesis 2.15 the task is to serve and keep. And shame on us, we think that it's gardening. See, the Garden of Eden is not just kind of a place where you grow food and flowers and crops and, and some trees. It's not green space. The Garden of Eden is sacred space. God is there. And a sacred space, it is like a temple. God's presence in the middle of it. And you come there to meet with God and interact with God, to be in relationship with God. And sacred space needs to be cared for, to retain its sacred quality. And that's what priests do. So Adam and Eve are chosen to serve. That's a word that can refer to working the ground, but only when it has the ground as the direct object. Here it doesn't. Lots of times in the Pentateuch, it's a word describing priestly service. So they serve in sacred space, and they keep, they guard, they protect, they preserve. That's not a landscaping term. That's priestly. So they're given this priestly role, and that's why it's not good for Adam to be alone. Because he's been given this task of guarding sacred space. The help meet that's Eve is to help Adam as his ally. That's the closest we can get on what that word help meet means. She's an ally. As priests, they are representatives, not in the same way that archetypes are. Archetypes are embodied representatives. Priests are representatives in a different way, but what they do has an effect on all those they represent, which is important for the story of the fall, which we're not going to get to today. The priestly representation then different, differs from an archetypal representation. The priest says Israel, um, they are priests, Adam and Eve are priests, as Israel is a kingdom of priests. They mediate knowledge of God and access of God. Being priests, in a sense, assumes other people 
Who are you a priest for if there aren't other people around? The Bible, of course, hints that there are other people around. Cain finds a wife. I don't know, maybe you like the sister deal, but I, I don't go for it. Cain, it says, now everybody who finds me will kill me. Mom and dad? I mean, who are we talking about here? Cain builds a city. It's not called a city if you're the only one there. There's assumption of other people. So Adam and Eve are, are targeted. They're, they're picked out for this priestly role. They're shown the identity of humanity. And they are mediators for knowledge and access. So, if the details of the forming apply to the archetypes, we have no information about the forming of individuals. That's not what this text is. That's not the claims that this text makes. It's not making a claim about material biological origins. Archetypal identity does not negate individual. We've said that already. Appropriate question is not, is this what really happened, but is this really who we are? Because identity is the issue. So the message of the Genesis archetypes, humans created with mortal bodies, provisioned by God. I'm going fast now because I'm running out of time. Given the role of serving in sacred space, divided into male and female. These are all important messages that come out of this understanding of archetypes. By the way, the ancient Near East doesn't dictate to us how we interpret scripture, but throughout the ancient Near East, all the stories about creation of humans have to do with archetypes. And they use ingredients, not always dust, but they use ingredients in order to communicate something archetypal about humanity, made from the blood of a god. That's communicating something. So, if Genesis 2 has an archetypal focus, there is no biblical account of material human origins. Now, that doesn't mean that common descent or evolution is true. I'm not addressing those questions. I'm just trying to say, does the Bible make a claim that causes us to foreclose that conversation? If it doesn't, then we can listen to what they have to say. We might like it, we might not. But we don't foreclose on it based on saying, the Bible says that Adam was made from dust, not through a common ancestry. Yeah. Well, if, it, if dust is talking about human origins, that might make a point, but I've tried to suggest that it's not. Special, direct, creative work of God is available. I'm not going to go through those. Oh boy, I have all these slides on the New Testament. Believe me, I've been through it but we have two minutes left, so I'm not going to do this. This is all in my book, The Lost World of Adam and Eve. They've got 712 of them back there. Right. Okay, so putting together the theological issues. At the right time in his purposes, God conferred his image. I don't know how, and I suspect it's complex. It's not just a poof, okay? So that's part of it. The identity and function given by God made humanity distinct from its genetic predecessors. Adam and Eve were real people in a real past, our representatives, and through whose actions we become accountable for sin. Okay, that's connected to the individuals. That's not archetypal. We're consequently doomed to death without the remedy of the death of Christ provided for our salvation. Putting together the science. Okay, again, I'm not going to go through this because the science is not really the issue here. So how should we think? We have to recognize the importance of what the Bible actually claims. Secondly, we have to accept those who may choose differently. See, what we're interested in is, are people treating the Bible as authoritative? Are they using a sound, consistent hermeneutic? Are they doing faithful interpretation? We all know very well that people can do that. Two different people can do that and come to different conclusions. We know it about the end times. We know it about gender roles. We know it about denominations. We know this. Good Christians, faithful Christians, interpreting the Bible the best they can, sometimes come to different conclusions. That's okay. We have to accept them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Acceptance of science does not require the rejection of Bible or faith. So, 
There we are. Time for you to ask some questions. I'm sure there are things that need clarification. Again, congenial conversation. They'll know we're Christians by our love. Let's show it in the way that we converse over controversial issues. Yes? Yeah. Um, help me understand uh, how you would interpret then Paul in 1 Timothy 2 where he says, um, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived. That doesn't, to me, that doesn't strike me as archetypal. No, that one is not. I said, that's why I said most. Yeah, most. Okay, because that one, that's Adam and Eve as individuals involved in a particular act. So there it is, individual. But at the same time, he then draws out what happened individually to have some larger, yeah. One over here, Kurt. So just clarifying then on that, because that was similar to what I was going to ask. So, so the fall was to actual people. So sin entered through Adam, and that was... So the fall that they're referring to is, and so we suffer the consequences of that fall through those two people who were the genetic. Yes. Um, uh, again, I don't see the influence of the fall passed on genetically, however. But, but those two people who became God's chosen people were our descendants for, for sin as well. Like those two people. Not our, our, sin comes to all of us through the acts of those two individuals. Okay. okay. How it comes to all of us, the Bible doesn't say. We've always never been short of models, but the Bible doesn't say how it comes to all of us, but it says it does, and we believe it. Okay. Through Thank those you. two individuals. Thank you. Uh, Professor Walton, thanks for this great talk. I'm curious as to um, <clears throat> why the interpretation that you give can't be a uh, both and rather than an either or. So for example, <clears throat> let's assume I'm intrigued and like a lot of what you have to say about the um, b about your model with respect to um, Adam and Eve as archetypes. But why can't we also say the Bible is also telling us something about material origins? Again, I'm always looking for what the... He'll be back in a minute. Yeah. I'm always looking for what the biblical evidence actually shows. Again, remember I used Psalm 103 to demonstrate that it says we're all formed from dust, and that clearly is not material origins. So, then I track that back. In other words, if it does refer to material origins, you would have to be able to demonstrate that. Uh, I'm not even convinced the Israelites or anybody in the ancient world, cared about material origins. That's a very minute, trivial point in one sense, um, because the fact is, it, no matter what we're made of, God made us more than what we're made of, which is the key point. We are more than our ingredients. Whether you think the ingredients are, are dust, or stardust, or monkeys, primates, or amoeba, the point always is, God has made us more than what we are made of. And in that case, the made of part becomes rather trivial. I have my son to thank for those thoughts. He's here with me. By the way, he's also the designer of the PowerPoint. Yeah, just saying. Yes? Um, this is all very scholarly and very interesting. But a lot of the world thinks this is a great big myth and it's a nice little fairy tale to teach children to get the ideas and that um, this really didn't happen, but that it's a very nice way to explain it all. And then the rest of the women say, and we have to suffer in childbirth, and there has to be weeds in the garden as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how would you counter the fairy tales that, and the myths that have just been handed down? Mm -hmm. And of course, that goes back to what I believe about the Bible. I accept the Bible as God's revelation of himself, as authoritative, and therefore, I believe that what it affirms is true. Now, it's always tricky to say, what is it that it affirms? Okay, and that's, that's the process of interpretation that goes on. Um, the people who say this is just a fairy tale mythology, well, that's because that's how they understand the Bible as a whole, rather than thinking of it the way that I do. So that's a faith issue, uh, a commitment that I make about the, what I believe that distinguishes it. 
Uh, in both uh, Genesis 2 and 3, there's reference to the ground. Uh, it's not just the dust. Uh, so how would you address that? I'm thinking especially Genesis 3, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. Right. And of course, ground in Hebrew is a wor the word adama, which is related to adam. And so again, the text is making a point of our identity. We are earthy um, and connected to that stuff. So it's identity again. And that, Dr. Walton, in Genesis 2.15, you mentioned that the, the verbs were serve and keep. As I look at a few translations, the serve part is translated uh, to tend, to take care of, to cultivate. So how do you come up with the definition of serve from that, from that verse? Yeah. The, uh, again, the translation uh, can take very many forms, as you just demonstrated. Uh, in order to determine what sort of definition we could give it in a context, the key ingredient will be what its direct object is. Okay, so uh, if people tend to the garden, well, again, why would you think that Hebrew verb means tending gardens? You have to look at other places and see what it says. The garden is the direct object. Tend the garden and keep its direct object. They're pronouns, but serve it or tend it and keep it. Now, then you have to ask the question, so is the garden growing space for food or is it sacred space? Uh, it certainly is a place where God has planted it for food for us. Okay, but it's also um, demonstrably sacred space. And so then there becomes a decision. Now, if it were just avad, just serve, tend, whatever... Um, then you would have a harder decision. It's because it uses shamar, keep, also, which is not an agrarian type of term that leads us to the priestly direction. Dr. Walton, thanks so much for your, your uh, talk today. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we face as believers is there are an awful lot of translations out there mm -hmm. to read. So would you recommend one that more accurately actually speaks to these issues because... I don't honestly know of any, and people who read the Bible and scholars who study the Bible have had hundreds of years to address these issues, so what translation out there is there available for us to purchase today that addresses these issues throughout the entire length of the scriptures from beginning to end? Thank this you. Would, this would be a great opportunity to give a plug to Biblica since they're here in the NIV, and the NIV is a great translation. The fact is, however, no translation is perfect. Every translation requires interpretation. That's what translation is. You can't render the meaning in one language into another language until you know the meaning. And therefore, translations by their nature are interpretive. Now, that doesn't make them unreliable. It just means that we always have to you know, take opportunity when necessary to go back and look. Even if I had done my own translation and had it out there, which I haven't, um, I've been involved on translation committees, but even if I've had done that, I wouldn't tell you to, to take my translation as this is right all the time. Uh, it's good to compare translations. Um, and that sometimes can uh, help you identify where there are places that need our uh, attention. And the last question, last question coming here. Hi, Dr. Wells. I just wanted uh, some clarification on the origins of the human mortality thing that you mentioned. Um, and just the whole idea of, you know, how the Bible says that, you know, in the day that, you know, that, that you eat or you sin, you know, that, that you'll die. So were we, you know, originally created, uh, you know, with an expiration date and sin accelerated it? Or, you know, how do you see, you know, juxtaposing those two things? Oh, excellent question. Um, that, that phrase, when God says, in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. That's it's usually translated something along that line. Two things there need some close Hebrew attention. First of all, uh, in the day, uh, that's an overly narrow rendering of a Hebrew expression, which just means when. So it's not narrowing it to a 24-hour period or before the sun goes down or something like that. It's just a way, a way to say when. More importantly... The you will surely die uses a uh, Hebrew expression, uses actually even grammatical forms that English doesn't have. 
And when we see that same expression with this same verb in other places, it says that you will be doomed to die, sentenced to death. Well, that makes a big difference because it's not suggesting that when you take a bite, you keel over, you know, or that you've now got a 24-hour, you know. It, it says when, when you eat from the fruit, you will be doomed to die. And of course, that's exactly what happens. They eat the fruit, God casts them out of the garden, they lose the antidote, and therefore they're doomed to die. Doomed to their mortality, which they were created with. Okay? And so they are doomed to that death because they have no remedy. Uh, so we have no more time for questions at this time, but I'm sure... I'll be hanging around, be I'll hanging be at around. lunch. Yeah, great. great. So. Well, let's give them another round of applause. Thank you.